Well, the Connecticut tragedy might be new territory for us, but we all know these atrocities have gone on before. What I want to do today is against the backdrop of Connecticut, I want to talk to you about another atrocity that happened around the birth of Jesus that maybe you have forgotten. It was perpetrated by one of the most wicked, horrible human beings that has ever walked on this planet. And I think we will get some perspective for our story as we look back on their story. The perpetrator I'm talking about, the evil man I'm talking about, his name was Herod. He was the king, and he killed far more than 20 children in his day. You might remember the story. Herod hears that there's some wise men from a distant land, probably Iran, who have seen a star in the east, and they have come to say, where is the king that was born? And we will discuss who Herod was, but Herod was the king in and around Jerusalem. And when he heard that a king was born, he was very disturbed because he was quite a jealous individual. And so he went to his priest, and he said, you know the scriptures, where is a king supposed to be born? And they searched the scriptures, and they said, as best we can understand it from the Old Testament, a king will be born in Bethlehem. And so Herod goes back to these wise men, and he said, when did you see the star? And they told him, and he said, will you go and find this king? I will go and find him too, because I want to worship this king that has been born. But you and I know he didn't want to go worship the king who was born. He wanted to go and kill the king who was born. And because he didn't know exactly where this baby was, what Herod did, and this is in Matthew's Gospel, Herod actually issues a decree that all of the male babies, two years old and younger, in and around Bethlehem, be killed. This is called the Massacre of the Innocents. It's the biblical narrative of infanticide, gendercide, if you will, by Herod the Great, who was the Roman-appointed king of the Jews. Now, I need to give you more background because my hope is we're going to study this and you're going to see some things that are going to be very hope-filled for you. So with pen in hand, we're going to go quickly. I want to write down first some quick thoughts about Herod, then I'm going to talk to you about Jesus coming and hopefully this will all tie together and it'll make sense to you. Write this down because some of you say, who is Herod? I don't know the story. He was the puppet king for the Caesars. He was the puppet king for the Caesars. He is introduced to us in the Bible in Matthew chapter 2. He is called King Herod. Last week we talked about the fact that Caesar was the big guy over the Roman Empire. And we talked about there were many Caesars, Julius Caesar, but the big ones that we talked about were Caesar Augustus, who was the Caesar when Jesus came on the scene. We know that Augustus Caesar was called the Son of God because the Roman Parliament had declared Julius Caesar was a god. If Julius Caesar was a god, Augustus was his adopted son. That makes Augustus the son of God. And so he, wor he wanted people to worship him. And Luke comes along and Luke says, let me tell you something. There is another Lord, the true Lord. Caesar is not Lord. Jesus is Lord. That's what we got from Luke's gospel. But now we're in Matthew's gospel and Matthew is going to talk to us about King Herod. Now, if you're the Caesar and you rule the world from the British coastline all the way to India how do you control the world well I'll tell you exactly how they do it there was a long and old standing principle of Roman policy that you would employ kings as one of the instruments of servitude you would hire kings who had their little areas and you would say as long as you do what we want you to do you can stay in power but if you cross us you're out and this was the way that they maintained control of the world in the land of Israel, they found a young warrior about 40, 42 years before Jesus was born. There was a young warrior by the name of Herod. He was half Jewish and he was half Edomite. He had made himself useful to the Romans in the wars and civil wars of Palestine and they liked him. Indeed, they liked him so much they made him governor of Palestine in 47 BC. And he does a really good job of keeping the people under control. 
Later, because he's a political-minded man, he marries the, into the leading Jewish family, the Hasmoneans. That was a big family name back in the day. He marries into that family, and he does so well that in 40 B.C., the Roman Senate calls Herod the king of the Jews. The Jews hated that for a couple of reasons. One, he was not fully Jew by birth. Number two, he was not a Jew by religion. But the Romans said he is the king of the Jews. He would reign for 40 years. And of all the despots that we have known in our lifetime around the world that are called horrific, horrible men, he ranks as the worst you would ever read about. Write this down. Number two, he was a fierce warrior in his day, a fierce warrior. His resume was impressive as a killer. First, he captured the bandit leader Ezekiel. He executed him. That was a big deal in ancient history. He besieged Jerusalem in 37 B.C. with a huge army of 11 battalions of infantry and 6,000 cavalry. When the troops poured in, a massacre ensued. The troops were determined to leave none of their opponents alive, and masses of people in Jerusalem were butchered in the alleys, crowded together around their houses. We're talking about hundreds and hundreds of people butchered by Herod. He was a bad guy. Number three, write this down. In history, he is an unparalleled builder. You cannot find in history anyone who built bigger and better than did Herod. One of the things we find about Herod is he built statues of Caesar everywhere. He was like the biggest kiss-up in the whole wide world. And if Caesar is your boss, you just build stuff and you put Caesar's name on it so Caesar is happy with you. Altars everywhere, statues everywhere. And if you're building these statues in and around the people known as the Jews... This makes you even more unpopular because the second commandment says thou shalt not bear any uh, graven images and he is putting graven images everywhere. He's a builder that was kind of crazy in the way he thought. King David, when he was fleeing for his life from King Saul, David had hid in a cave near Masada. So Herod says if the person they think is the greatest king of the Jews lived in a cave, then I will build for me the most beautiful palace in the world in Masada. He built a three-story palace so he could live in luxury. I wish we could see this. Marble inlaid, designs, beautiful, hot and cold baths there, Italian columns made of solid marble imported from Rome. He had artists come in and paint frescoes on the wall. On the top of the roof, Where it hadn't rained in 700 years, he had a swimming pool installed. It had not rained in 700 years. We're talking about 2,000 years ago. He puts a swimming pool on top of his palace. Now, if it hadn't rained, the question is, where does he get the water supply? Herod's a builder. He gets it from Jerusalem 17 miles away. He builds these giant channels from Jerusalem that carry the water to his swimming pool on the top of his palace at Masada. He figured out a way how to store food that has baffled archaeologists to this day. In the 60s, they found food that had been stored by Herod, and it was still edible. Dates, you know, figs, dates, they had found them. Wouldn't have wanted to taste what a 2,000-year-old date tasted like, but they found them. He was unbelievably advanced. He decided along the coastline that he wanted to build a state-of-the-art city. The problem is the coastline was swampy and couldn't be built upon. No one had ever been able to build a city or even a port here, but he knew he could make a lot of money if he could redirect the shipping lines, so he rebuilt the coastline. 2,000 years ago, Herod rebuilds the coastline. He drains the marshes, and in the spot where no one else could build anything, he creates a state-of-the-art city called Caesarea. Oh, by the way, who would Caesarea be named for? Caesar? Caesarea, look at your beautiful city. The largest harbor in the world in that day was 60 acres. It was Athens, Greece. Herod said, I'll build one 520 acres. And he does at Caesarea. He figures out a way to pour concrete 80 feet down under the ocean surface. Makes it 100 feet wide. He builds an underground sewage system that would drain with the tides. The nearest freshwater source was 19 miles away. 19 miles away, so he builds an aqueduct to connect with the city, and he makes it so perfect that it falls 
um, just enough to get the water where he needs it to go. And now when archaeologists have found this aqueduct, it is less than a centimeter off from the design that he made 2,000 years ago. He built a palace that went over the ocean, so it had water on three sides, but he also wanted fresh water, so he built a freshwater pool in the middle. He built this wonderful auditorium. This auditorium, you can stand at the bottom and you can talk in a normal voice, and people in the far reaches of this auditorium can hear you perfectly. One historian said he had built a really large stadium, so the archaeologists are looking for this stadium, and they finally find it, and they think, well, this isn't very big. Maybe the historian had been exaggerating, but as they continued to dig, they dug up 350,000-seat auditorium, a 350,000-seat auditorium, and they say that they, it probably would seat half a million people. The inside track was a mile point three. If you can imagine, our stadiums seat 60, 70,000 people. This seated 500,000. There was a story that a city had been built and Herod is sailing back from Rome on his ships and he didn't like the way the city looked. It just didn't have enough sparkle to it. This was Caesarea. So he has the whole city covered in marble. And today if you go to Caesarea, you can still find shards of marble on the shore where he had the whole city inlaid in marble. Number four, write this down. Herod was an egomaniacal, paranoid murderer. Herod, on top of being all these other things, was an egomaniacal, paranoid murderer. The flaw in Herod's character was his desperate craving for power and his suspicion of others. The older he became, the more suspicious he became. As the years roll on, Herod proves to be a clever and cruel man. Like all despots, he held tightly to the reins of power and brutally removed anyone who ever got in his way. Over the years, he killed almost everybody that crossed his path. He killed his brother-in-law, he killed his mother-in-law, he killed his wife. And in fact, it was the murder of his wife, Miriam, that drove him mad. Interesting story, he became suspicious of his wife. He was going on a trip, so he says to one of his assistants, if I die on this trip, I want you to kill my wife. Well, the assistant tells the wife this. So Herod comes back from his trip, and the wife seems a little bit distant. Would you not be a little distant if you found out your husband was planning to kill you? So he killed her anyway, because he thought she must be a threat. And even though he killed her, for some reason that was a trigger for him. He never seemed to get over her death. He was 44 years old when he killed her, and he lived to be over 70, but her murder was the beginning of all these murders you see above everything else Herod the Great was a killer that was his nature he was a killer he killed out of spite he killed to stay in power human life meant nothing to him the Jewish historian Josephus called him barbaric another writer dubbed him the uh, malevolent maniac the malevolent maniac another called Herod the great pervert he became suspicious of one of his sons, so he had him drowned in one of his swimming pools. Perhaps his basic character can best be seen by one incident in the year 7 B.C. This is several years before Jesus is born. Herod is an old man. He's been in power 41 years. He knows he doesn't have much longer to live, but he believed two of his sons were plotting against him, so he brought them in before him and said, you make a defense for yourselves. Can you imagine your sons come in and you say, you were planning to kill me. You make a defense for yourselves. They said, they, we don't know what you're talking about. One historian was there and recorded what they say, and it is gut-wrenching to hear them say, Father, we, we, we don't know what you're talking about. We, we, we love you. We're not trying to do anything to you. But he's so paranoid, he had them killed. He orders them to be put to death by strangling. He had a dispute with the governing body of the Jewish people, and he had them all executed. Caesar Augustus said this of Herod, it's better to be Herod's pig than his son. Less likely to kill you if his, you're his pig than his son. His wife, mother-in-law, brothers-in-law, his sons, hundreds of others, killing was what he did best. He assassinated all three of his sons, um, Antipater, Alexander, Aristopolis. At the end of his life, this is horrible, at the end of his life he withdrew to his favorite city, which was Jericho, and he ordered the selection of the most influential people in the country, and he said, you get them all together and hold them under house arrest. Why did he do this? Because when he died, he wanted them all slaughtered 
so it would make, ensure that there would be crying in town when he died. He was not a good man. Write this down. Final thing about Herod, he was, according to some historians, the richest man ever. According to some historians, he was the richest man ever. One estimate had it that his personal payroll was 500,000 people. He decided to make the temple of God bigger in Jerusalem because he felt like that would help his relationship with the Jews. So he hired 18,000 people to build it. He built it with something called Herodian stones. These stones are three stories large. They're impossible to move. It would take a, uh, a crane that would move a, a ship to move these stones, but somehow these people moved these stones from miles away to Jerusalem. I've seen them. He decided he wanted to have a palace in between Jerusalem and his home country of Edom, Edom, but he wanted it on a mountaintop, and there was no mountain there, so he had the people build him a mountain. Crazy things that he did. This was called Herodian. It had 200 steps to it, a nine-foot deep pool with a gazebo in the middle that you could only get to by boat. He built gymnasiums for several towns. He was a big instrument in the producing of the Olympic Games, uh, not, of course, in Palestine, but in and around the Roman Empire. He built walls for cities, halls, porticos, temples, marketplaces, theaters, aqueducts, baths, fountains, colonnades. He was way bigger than Bill Gates or Warren Buffett ever could be. He also was very instrumental in the building of Jerusalem. If you went to Jerusalem today, you would see much of what you would see as the ancient part of Jerusalem was built by King Herod. One of the things that you'll notice about Jerusalem is there's no farmland in the city. Herod lived in a palace surrounded by people in his government, and he controlled the religious establishment. He controlled the government systems, the economic systems. So you have a tight group of elitists living in the city. But where did they get their food? 80 to 90% of the people in Jesus' day were involved in agricultural work. Most of Jesus' parables were about agricultural things. These were working-class peasants. They were the ones that provided the food for the elites in and around Jerusalem to be able to eat. Now, Herod the Great would take 27 to 33% of grain as taxes. He would take 50% of all fish as taxes. So imagine you're a little local fisherman, and you go out and you fish all night, and you come back with 10 fish. The first thing you do is you give five of them to the tax collector that's there waiting for you when you come to the shore. The tax collectors were called the Toloni, and they would take 50% of what you, ha- what you made to give it to Herod. A high-level delegation went to Rome to complain of Herod's tyranny, the way he kept his people in poverty, those that were outside of the city, how he kept them in poverty, and he had them all killed. The west section of Jerusalem several years ago was excavated. They found a bottle of wine that had been sold in Herod's day for the equivalent of $20,000. The rich were so rich in and around Jerusalem while the poor had nothing. You have a few people with all the money, and the masses are living in poverty. Well, now we come to Matthew chapter 2. And in Matthew 2, Herod is 60 years old, over 60. He's slowly dying. Josephus, the historian, describes the disease he has as a kind of foul distemper. His body is racked with convulsions. His breath is foul. His skin covered with loathsome sores. And he is rapidly losing his mind, but he is still the king. And one day word comes in from Jerusalem that there are some visitors that have arrived from the east. Strange men with a strange question. They are the Magi, the wise men from the east. They were priests of an oriental religion who practiced astrology. They came from what we know as Iran or Persia. They were considered powerful men and they had journeyed across the desert seeking an interview with Herod. The important thing to Herod was not who they were, But the answer to the question they ask, look on the screen. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and said, Where is the one who was born King of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and we have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. Why would all Jerusalem be disturbed? That's where the money was. All of Jerusalem, they liked how it was in Jerusalem. Herod kept them in their lifestyle. They didn't want anybody else to rock the boat. Verse 4, when he had called together all of the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Christ was to be born. 
They said, In Bethlehem and Judea, for this is what the prophet wrote in the scriptures, You, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. Herod called the Magi secretly. He found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. And then he sent them to Bethlehem, and he said, Go and make a careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. That's not going to happen. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary. They bowed down and worshipped him. They opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, of incense, and of myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. Well, there are many mysteries about this. Who precisely are the wise men? We don't know. Where do they come from? Exactly, we don't know. What was this star they saw in the sky? We don't know. Herod didn't know either, but he knew he better find out what was about to happen. They were looking for someone born king of the Jews. How could that be? Herod was the king of the Jews. But Herod wasn't born that way. He had to fight and kill to gain that title. What were these men talking about, king of the Jews? The Bible says when Herod heard, that he heard this, he was disturbed, and the word disturbed means he would shake. He shook violently. He was so angry. He shook violently. And finally, he's thinking, I have subdued all of my enemies. I have killed all of my foes. I'm ready to die triumphantly, but now these strangers come along and they say a king has been born. Y'all, what we're talking about in the Christmas story is a revolutionary message. Write this down. Last week, Luke said, who is the Lord? Is it Caesar? No, it's Jesus. This week, Matthew is going to be asking us in the text, who is the king? Is Herod the king? Or is Jesus the king? Now, I'm going to give you three quick thoughts, and then we're going to close, and I think it's going to all pull together. Matthew is saying some things to me when I think about Herod as this horrible king, and I compare him to Jesus. Matthew's saying some things to me. Write this down. Number one, he is saying, don't despair. Ray, don't despair. I've not forgotten you. There is a new king in town, and his name is Jesus. If you feel poor, or you are hurting, or you are grieving, or you feel abandoned, God is saying to you, don't despair, there is a new king in town. Another thing I believe Matthew is saying to us is don't give up. When you think about the horrific Herod as king, and you think about the oppression that we experience sometimes in this world, and the atrocities like Friday in Connecticut, don't give up. It's not over yet. There is a new king in town. You may be feeling bullied or beaten down or like there is no hope or you can't get a break. There's a new king in town. And finally, I think Matthew is wanting us to think about this. Don't settle for bondage in your life under Herod when you can be free because there's a new king in town. I want us to go a little deeper just for a couple of minutes. Matthew has all kinds of traditions he can pull from, all kinds of events that are happening, but he chooses to point out Herod is the king, and now this baby is born, and he is being called king because Matthew wants us to see this. The world says this is the king. This is how things are. Matthew says there is a new king in town. I want you to get it. If you're the reader, you're being confronted by Matthew. Who is going to be the king in your life? Is Herod going to be the king in your life? Or is Jesus going to be the king in your life? Ray, if you'll come up here, we just I want, I want just to kind of head to the home front, and I just want you to be ready to play something on the piano, if you will. But I want you to listen to me just a moment. You look around in that day, and you see power and wealth and possessions and influence and statues and hot tubs and Masada and the Olympic Games. And you wonder, who is the king? Who is the king? You see, when Matthew presents this in his gospel, this is a story about religion. Herod was controlling religion in the day. But Matthew wants us to know there's a new king. 
intact. This is a story about politics. Has Herod been a good king? Or was it time for change? Matthew wants us to think it's time for change. The way it's always been hasn't been good. This is a story about economics. The story is being written to a group of poor minorities in the center of an empire where they have been reduced to the poorest of poor. The rich are getting richer, the poor are getting poorer. You've lost your family land, you're struggling to make it day by day, and into this scene, Matthew says, there's a new king in town. There's a new king in town. Imagine that you live in some village in Galilee and the people around you have heavy debt. You have lost your family land, you can't pay your bills. And Herod has just announced he's going to tax you some more because he wants to build another palace. He wants to build another aqueduct. He wants to build another thing to Caesar. And you're going to have to come out of pocket more. Matthew says a new king is here. A new king is here. It's not an announcement that's been made to generals or religious leaders. This announcement was first made to shepherds, the poorest of the poor, which says to all of us, regardless where you are in your life, the announcement comes to you how things are or how they have been but there is a new king in town the announcement is being made to you there is a new king in town there is a new king in town imagine if your family members had been killed by Herod Herod once took a golden eagle which was the symbol of Rome and he put it right above the entryway to the temple in Jerusalem just to tick people off and so when the people the religious leaders complained about it oh he killed all of them had them all killed. He kills everybody that gets in his way. They tell us that Herod would dress in civilian clothes sometimes and go walk around town and just hear what people were saying about Herod. And then he would get a careful description of how they were dressed. He would go back and he would say, kill this person, kill this person, kill this person. This is a story about worship. It's about that the fact that the Herods of this world, they eventually all die. Their kingdoms, while they appear big and lofty, they all fade away. But there's a new king in town, and his kingdom will never fade away. His kingdom only gets bigger and bigger and bigger. The Christmas story isn't about eggnog. It's not about fuzzy sweaters with reindeer on them. It's the story of the fact that against the backdrop of a world that is crazy, there's a new king in town. Herod doesn't get the last word. The Herods of this life do not get the last word. Why? Because a baby has been born. This is a story about hope. It's a story about love and mercy and grace. Why? Because a baby has been born. May you, when you find yourself wondering how long is Herod going to be on the throne, how long is it going to be like this, may that still small voice in your soul remind you, a baby has been born. When you find yourself realizing that Herod has sons who are going to continue his kingdom and oppress and cheat and steal, may you be reminded again, a baby has been born. When you find yourself slipping into the fatalism that says it's always going to be like this, it's always going to be like this, there's always going to be this horrible stuff going on in this life, and I'm never going to feel any hope, I'm never going to feel any peace, I'm never going to feel any security, may you remember a baby has been born. Herod doesn't have the last word. Herod's sons don't have the last word. Caesar Augustus doesn't have the last word. Cancer doesn't have the last word. Divorce doesn't have the last word. AIDS doesn't have the last word. Unemployment doesn't have the last word. And crazed killers of small children don't have the last word. Because there's a new king in town. There's a new king in town. Now let me tell you what this means to us. It means when tragedy strikes, we acknowledge we live in a crazy world. Yes, we do. It means that we have questions. Yes, we do. But we remind ourselves that Jesus came as a baby, never promising to deliver us in every circumstance by his power. What he said was, I will walk with you in my love. In every circumstance, I will walk with you in my love. And so when our heart is breaking, we see Jesus there with us because he said, in this life, you will have trouble. In this life, you will have persecution, but I will be there with you. So we remember that. 
And when we hang on to that, then something happens in us and we say, you know what? In this life, we will strive for a better world. We will strive to tip the scales right. When we see despots and we see people who are evil and we see people taking advantage of others, we will fight for the underdog. We will protect our children. We will say you're not going to get close to them. We will do everything we can to bring the kingdom of God here. And we also will acknowledge one day, one glorious day, it will be perfect one day, but not yet. And I just want to close with one more scripture because some of you, this children's thing, I want you to know there's never been any group of people in this world closer to Jesus than children. And I was reading this morning from the message, the Gospel of Mark, and this is what it says, the people brought children to Jesus, hoping that he might touch them. And the disciples shooed them off, but Jesus was irate, and he let them know it, and he said, don't push these children away. Don't ever get between them and me. These children are at the very center of life in the kingdom. Mark this. Unless you accept God's kingdom in the simplicity of a child, you'll never get in. You'll never get in. Then gathering the children up to his arms, he said, he laid his hands of blessing on them. Do I think he was there with those children? Listen, sometimes we post things on Facebook that we need to think about. Because of a Supreme Court ruling, are you telling me Jesus wasn't there with those children? He was there with those children. He goes where he wants to go. He was there with them. A crazy man did a crazy thing, absolutely. But Jesus was there. And he loves them. And he loves you. And he is the king of of everything and you and I can say today Herod is not my king Jesus is my king and I will live in his kingdom by choice today forever would you bow your heads please our father in heaven I pray right now all of us would think about the Herods of this world those people that are the big bosses that like to hold others down. People who, because of their power, like to get their own way. And I pray today we would say we're not living in that kingdom. There's a new king in town, and his name is Jesus. And we will live in his kingdom where we will have peace in the midst of all these troubles. We will have confidence knowing that he ultimately is victorious. He wins, he wins, he wins. And we will do everything in our power to live this life in accordance to his kingdom rule. And it'll make a difference in our lives and the people we're able to affect around us. May we always fight for those who are being hurt. May we always fight for those that are being pushed down. May we always take a stand for those that are the outsiders. Letting them know that you love them. We pray this in Jesus' name.